I want to uh, introduce today's speakers. They are Susan and Jack Davis, and they live in Bozeman, Montana, way up there. They've been Wichita Postcard Club members for years and years. And in 1996, Jack Davis and Tom Mulvaney joined and they teamed together and they were speakers at that year's 1996 Wichita show. They talked about collecting national parks. You won't believe it, but up until then, there wasn't a lot of interest in national parks. It's kind of like Niagara Falls or Times Square in New York. I, those are probably not the best examples, but they really, uh, with that audience of collectors and dealers in the audience, that kind of was the snap. I don't do that very well, but that was kind of the snap to uh, uh, making people aware of all of this rich material, many publishers, many series, many parks. They talked about specifically that day, Yellowstone National Park. And uh, it's been great fun ever since. Out of that came uh, one or two people creating checklists of all of the uh, material. And so they, uh, it just, uh, it's snowballed and it's uh, become really one of the uh, most collectible of the uh, postcard fields. They're talking about today their uh, new book called Postals from Wonderland and it's Yellowstone Postcard Messages. And uh, it, it's, it's most interesting. They had, uh, they've made some discoveries. I'm gonna let them talk about that. And I won't, I won't uh, take away from uh, their, their fun of telling you about what they talked about. But why don't we go ahead and turn it over to Susan and Jack Davis and let them tell about their new book and what they've found. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Al. Um, thank you for joining this presentation. We're going to discuss our new book, Postals in Wonderland, Yellowstone Postcard Messages. Uh, the book contains handwritten messages by tourists and were mailed to friends and family. Uh, the postcards and the book date 1900 through 1981. And um, Sue's going to talk about the backdrop behind us. Our backdrop today is an early postcard back that we blew up. We just returned from a three-day book signing at the Old Faithful Inn in Yellowstone Park. We had tourists from around the world write a 150th birthday message to Yellowstone. We completed two of these large postcards and also a smaller one for children to sign. So we brought that today to put as our backdrop. So uh, we did go to the Old Faithful Inn to sign books. It was very successful. We met people from all over the world. Uh, we're gonna give you a brief background of our postcard collecting. I've collected Yellowstone souvenirs and postcards for 55 years. My first souvenir was a box of 50 Haynes postcards circa 1925 and was purchased in the summer of 1967 when I got out of high school. On the left is a greeting card that I designed with die cut corners so you could insert an original postcard. We sold these to many national parks and gift shops from 1988 to 2005. Then on the right of the screen is a picture of the interior of Old America Antiques, our postcard and paper shop from 1900 to 2000. It was the only shop of its kind between Minneapolis and Spokane. We hosted a, uh, six National Park paper and postcard shows in Bozeman. Uh, they were the only shows of their kind. and. Um, we, we published that the, the, the show attracted dealers and collectors from everywhere. We had dealers coming from 15 states. Um, we had to discontinue the show in 1998. One of the reasons is because the internet was beginning to affect the shows. 
and a lot of the dealers that were coming to the shows uh, were not able to wait one year to sell their items that they could sell them sooner than that. Uh, but the show was very successful. Uh, we even had a phone call from a superintendent of uh, Gettysburg National Park asking if we had Confederate uh, memorabilia at our show. And I said, no, we, I'm sure we don't. And he said, well, he would be there anyway. And he came out. Um, so it was a very popular show. Uh, it really took collecting National Park and especially Yellowstone Park souvenirs to another level. We published a series of booklets called the Yellowstone Collector in 1994 through 1996 uh, to give collectors more information on postcards, postcard lists, and souvenirs. Uh, and it brought a lot of new collectors into the hobby. In 1995, Michael Francis and Kathleen Burke published the Yellowstone Park Checklist and it was a huge uh, tool for collectors to use to see the cards they had and didn't have. And these checklists that we published between ourselves uh, were very successful and, and made new collectors out of people that otherwise would probably not have collected the postcards. As Hal mentioned before, uh, in 1994, Rick Gary produced a postcard showing the Montana IFPD members on their way to Wichita. Myself and Susan, Frank and Barb Hood, and Tom, Mulva Tom Mulvaney, who's hanging on the back. Uh, uh, he always seems to be hanging on the back of everything, but there he is. Uh, a, a great friend, Tom. He's a super guy. and is the reason that we uh, got involved in postcards in the beginning. The card on the right is also by Rick Gary, 1996, when Tom and I gave the talk that Hal had mentioned, and Old Faithful Geyser is going off, and postcards are, are coming out of the geyser. Uh, That's a good one. <laughs> I have to, have to thank Hal for taking a chance. We, Tom Mulvaney and myself, went to Hal and said, how can we give a talk on National Park postcards. And he gave us kind of a funny look. <laughs> he and Tom were good friends. And he said, well, OK, I guess I'll take a chance. Oh. And uh, I'm telling <laughs> you, it, it made all the difference in the world to the hobby. New collectors came into the hobby. And there was a period of time that na the Yellowstone Park postcards were being collected throughout the country. Uh, so uh, Hal deserves credit for that. Uh, Jack and I had a collection that grew to 20,000 items, including more than 10,000 postcards. And our collection went to the Heritage and Research Center in Gardner, Montana, at the northern entrance to the park, where it's available for researchers. Um, it went in, in the year of 2001. It also included books, posters, artwork, souvenirs, photographs, and many more categories. On the left, you can see a, a brochure of, the, of our souvenir collection, and on the right is a brochure of our postcard collection with the bison head. We made these brochures for the Yellowstone Park Foundation members as a reference to our collection. You know, I will just say that the collection is now in the Heritage and Research Center is available for research. Uh, there were 10,000 postcards in the collection. When we made the donation, they did not have a good collection of postcards. Uh, we will be donating the message cards that we've written the book to the archives as well uh, for people to uh, reference. And I think that's very important that, that they have, have that material. Susan and I have written and published two postcard books. Uh, the book on the left, Samuel Smucker, The Discovery of His Lost Art, uh, we published in 2001. Um, we found 87 original paintings by Samuel Smucker that were produced for the Detroit Publishing Company uh, circa 1907. 
almost half of these paintings were unknown and they were new images, new Smucker images. Um, and on the right is the cover of our recent book, Postals from Wonderland, Yellowstone Postcard Messages. Uh, we decided to write this book August the 3rd, uh, 2021, uh, about 13 months ago. And we worked every day for six months to get the book completed and, and printed. Uh, it was a huge undertaking that um, we probably should have started earlier, but we had other projects we were doing. And we decided to do this book because this year is the 150th anniversary of the park. And we wanted the book to be able to go into shops this summer. Uh, we just barely made the deadline. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we've sold about 900 copies of the book. It's been very well received uh, and, and we're happy that we did it, even though it was a tremendous amount of work. We had a total of 925 messages in our book and I read and transcribed the messages on sticky notes using a magnifying glass and then attached each note to the uh, sleeve on the postcard. Then I gave them to Jack and he uh, entered them into the computer and word documents and then I checked them again to make sure that they were written verbatim because a lot of them were spelled wrong and no punctuation etc. Then the messages were placed in the appropriate chapters for the book, which we had 12 chapters, the two boxes on the left with the magnifying glass by it, those are the messages that went in our book. And the two boxes on the right were messages that didn't make the cut for this book, because so we had still had quite a few left over. Yeah, we had about 3,500 messages. Um, we used 925, and it took us many, many years to collect those messages. The, this is a, role, a low resolution proof that we received back from the printer uh, to check for image placement and color, and color, uh, color balance. Uh, we actually had eight of these proofs until we finally signed off uh, on the proof. Uh, it was a lot of work and uh, we were happy with the final results of the, of the card, of the book. This is the introductory message in the beginning of the book. And it says, August 27th, 1910, seeing so many wonderful things that I am beginning to feel like an Alice in Wonderland, Celia. Yellowstone was referred to as Wonderland from the very beginning of the park. Uh, in 1873, there was a guidebook published titled Wonderland Illustrated. It was followed by a series of Northern Pacific Railroad Wonderland brochures, 1883 through 1910. So the railroad promoted Yellowstone uh, as a wonderland, and uh, that name has stuck around with it uh, up until our book, which we uh, purposely titled Postals from Wonderland. This is the second postcard in the book. It's a real photo postcard, July 30th, 1913. Drove 75 miles today hot and dusty, radiator boiled over, Two flat tires. grandma got sick, Two flat tires. having a great time. So you can see grandma looks like she's having a really good time. <laughs> uh, and this was before cars were allowed into the park. Uh, they, uh, it was only stagecoach transportation uh, and these people would drive the car to the boundary of the park, and then they would have to enter the park in horse-drawn transportation. This is uh, chapter one, uh, Roosevelt Arch and Gardner Gateway, and a Detroit publishing card is on the left showing a stagecoach coming through the arch. And the card on the right is the Cracker Jack Bear card number 15. Uh, it was published as a prize and boxes of Cracker Jack candy. Uh, many of these cards are soiled. 
and I'm going to try to read this. I um, can't see the whole thing, but I'll make an effort here. Um, no, actually, I can move this over. Oh, don't shoot, Mr. President. We're the Cracker Jack Bears. Yes, we met you at the White House in Washington. Don't you remember? Oh, Mr. Teddy, drop your gun. For us, such business is no fun. So please don't keep us on the rack, because we're the Bears with Cracker Jack. 30 miles to Yellowstone Park, copyright 1907. And this is uh, also chapter one. Um, it just so happened by chance that uh, we had some pages on Gardner Canyon, which was the northern entry to the park. It was a beautiful canyon. Uh, a road went up the canyon to Mammoth Hot Springs. And you can see the real photo card with the, with the car and the Gardner River behind it. Um, we were at a conference for collecting Yellowstone June the 6th. Uh, I gave a talk at that conference. Exactly one week later was the devastating floods in Yellowstone, and this road completely washed out. Uh, it will no longer be used as an entry. Uh, they're building a new road to the west of the canyon, and uh, it, this canyon has served as an entry to the park since the Hayden Expedition in 1871. Uh, it was a beautiful drive. People looked forward to doing the drive. You can see the stagecoaches, the stagecoach in the left-hand side. Uh, so it's a, it's a real tragedy that uh, this road has been uh, destroyed and uh, can no longer be used. This is chapter two, Mammoth Hot Springs, uh, and the the, on the right is a early uh, postcard showing a group of people by a ladder that goes down to Devil's Kitchen, uh, July 7th, 1910. Took a coach trip $1 over the top, then saw the white elephant and went down a stairway into Devil's Kitchen. Uh, this is no longer uh, accessible to the public. Uh, but it is an interesting story that uh, people like, and it's postcards showing the social history of that time uh, and what they were doing at that time. This is chapter three, O Faithful Geyser and O Faithful Inn. Uh, this, this postcard message is circa 1902 and is one of my favorites. At this geyser at 11 o'clock at night, our party and a party of four men met. There was an Austrian archduke, a German newspaper man, a globetrotter, and an old miner. They drank wine to Old Faithful, and after the water subsided, broke their glasses and threw them into the crater. We mentioned that we just did a book signing in the Old Faithful Inn in the lobby of the Old Faithful Inn. It was quite an experience. Um, and this, the postcard on the right is the earliest postcard we have relating to the Old Faithful Inn. The message. It's actually an artist rendition. Uh, Fr Frank J. Haynes was friends with the architect Robert Reamer and must have photographed uh, this uh, rendition into a postcard uh, before the Old Faithful Inn was built. And the message states, just opened six weeks, built of logs, cost $150,000, furnishing $40,000, old cast iron clock on chimney, summer house with green electric bulbs on fourth story, searchlights, popcorn geyser, old faithful geyser, several bears. And some of this information is really primary source information uh, that was written at the time, in the moment. Uh, and I think there's information on postcards, uh, which proves to be historically important. Um, and we had a poster of this that we blew up 40 by 30 on a poster board. And we had it in our booth and many, many people came over to read the card and look at the card and they were fascinated by the card uh, i told them that at that time messages had to be written on the front of the card 
which they thought was really interesting. Um, and we donated this poster to the concessionaire that ran the gift shop in the lobby of the Old Faithful Inn, and they were very happy to have it, and they're going to put it up for display uh, for other people. This is chapter four, Geysers and Hot Springs, and the message is date, dated June 28th, 1922. This is surely a wonderland, not a fairyland. Some of the pools, of course, are very beautiful. The geysers are the main thing. They are rather uncanny. The mosquitoes were very bad last night, Hank. This is chapter number four, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Five. Um, and there's an interesting story about this. Um, Thomas Moran was a famous painter who his work helped to convince Congress to establish Yellowstone. His paintings and, and field sketches from 1871, uh, along with William Henry Jackson's photographs, uh, were presented to Congress and Congress established Yellowstone in 1872. Now, at our conference that we were at in June, uh, the Department of Interior curator was at the conference. And I get, this slide was part of my presentation. And after the presentation, she came up to me and she said that her job, she was in charge of the Thomas Moran paintings in the National Gallery but she had never seen and was unaware of this information on these postcards. So we gave her a book, gave her a couple of books, and she was very excited. She was going to go back and enter this information into their database. Uh, it's just another example of postcards containing information uh, that might not be published anywhere else, uh, including a, a circa 1935 linen postcard. Uh, the small postcard on the bottom left uh, is a miniature card that came in a pack of cigarettes. This is chapter five, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and the message dates July 19, 1924. My dear honey, last Sunday an auto went over this canyon and two people in it were instantly killed. The cross marks the spot where I saw their wrecked car. Papa and I are starting for a hike to the foot of this canyon. Yesterday, we went to the top of it. Don't forget that postal you are going to write us, Mother. This is chapter six, Yellowstone Lake and Fishing. Uh, and the image on the right, Fishing Bridge, Yellowstone Lake Outlet, J.E. Haynes photo. Jack Ellis Haynes was the son of Frank Haynes, F.J. Haynes, it was a family business. Uh, June 10th, 1940, Dear Mother and Lois, here we are at Fishing Bridge, Yellowstone Park. We have 50 big trout to take home. Loads of people here and the park doesn't officially open until June 20. Leaving for home this noon, we are here with Ed and Ethel. This image, this is also chapter six, Yellowstone Lake and Fishing. Uh, and the image on the right, is from the Haynes 100 series postcards printed in Germany. And I need to just tell you a little bit about Haynes. Uh, F.J. Haynes first came to Yellowstone Park in 1881 as the official photographer for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, he was granted a concessionaire license in 1883 and established a series of 15 Haynes photo shops throughout the park. Uh, his shops essentially controlled uh, sales of souvenirs in the park, including postcards. Uh, one interesting thing is that he would not sell Detroit publishing cards. They were a competitor and Detroit publishing sued Haynes uh, for uh, trade restrictions and they lost the lawsuit. So Haynes basically controlled almost all of the cards sold in the park. Uh, there was one other gift shop that sold uh, Detroit publishing cards, but they were the only shop in the park. Detroit publishing cards uh, sold outside the park. Uh, and this Haynes 100 series was printed 
and Germany in 1908, 1909, and 1912. Uh, the, the person that you see standing with the cook's apron and hat, uh, his name was Larry Matthews, and he was a cook at Thumb Lunch Station, which was near the lake. Uh, Haynes knew him, asked him to pose for this, and then included him in the postcard. This is chapter seven, wildlife and beggar bears. The message um, on the left from July 18th, 1956 says, Dear Cynthia, we saw these geysers and they, and they are really beautiful. We saw a big black mama bear with three cubs. Two of the cubs got in a fight over some popcorn. The mama growled and they quit. Love, mother and daddy. The card on the right says August 25th, 1939. Dear Walt and Aunt Mona, Don and boys saw a moose like this down in the water near Fishing Bridge. It charged a man who luckily made it behind a tree. Also saw 35 bear in the park. Took lots of pictures. Love, Helen and Al. Now, Al was mentioning that there was some important information on postcards that we uncovered. Uh, one, of, one of the cards I talked about was the Old Faithful Inn. Um, this, this to, to us, may be the most consequential message that we have. Uh, the bear that you're looking at was called a park bear. The photograph was taken circa 1895 by a young, uh, the son of a hotel manager uh, it was never really copyrighted. It was reproduced by many, many different uh, publishers in many different formats, postcards, uh, logos, Brochure. decals, uh, book illustrations, book covers, and many, many ways. So this, the image of this bear uh, is really an iconic image for the park, and it, it, it even, uh, it, is on some of the buildings at Mammoth Hot Springs. So this, there was a young girl who worked in the reception desk in the lobby of the Old Faithful Inn in 1912. And she wrote on the back of the Haynes 100 series postcards, descriptions of the images on the front. Uh, they were never mailed, but we were able to acquire her collection. And this message states, this is old Joe, I think one of the tamest bears in the park. He is thought to have been killed this spring by falling into a hot pool near Thumb Station. As a cub, he was captured and kept with his brother at the Wiley camp and were fed by tourists. The other bear got tangled up in the chains and was hung. After that, they let this fellow loose, but he always kept near the hotels and camps and was familiar with everyone. Uh, when we talked about this message at the conference that we were in, and the several historians were at that conference, they were all very impressed that the, the bear had a name, that it, that, and it, the background information, uh, it, it adds historical context. Uh, and that's one thing that postcards can do uh, is, 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 fo is to have a reflection of social history of their time, of that time. This is a real photo postcard, 1912, of a young girl feeding a stick of candy to a bear. Uh, we came up here this morning. We had rain and hail yesterday. This morning it was 28, sure cold. We saw several bears. One ate candy out of my hand. It is lovely here. Uh, this is a, a day. Uh, Feeding the bears led to beggar bears, which is this image. This message is dated July 13th, 1957. My dear, just entering Yellowstone today, had such a wonderful time. The bears greeted us as we entered. Father is feeling fine, wonderful weather. Love to all, Margaret. And for people that are not familiar with postcards, and I assume that everyone in this uh, Conference, then this presentation is, is familiar with them. Uh, 
the writing, the message had to be written on the front of the card initially uh, until 1907. This is a good example of a message written on the front of a card, but it's also a very interesting message. Dwell, grailing in July 25th, 1903. This is in chapter eight, Stagecoaches in Horse-Drawn Transportation. We arrived here about 7.30 p.m. after driving on stages a distance of 70 miles. Name of our stage is Fountain. We are sleeping in a log cabin tonight. As I am writing, we have a log fire burning. We start again tomorrow morning at 8 for another drive of 25 miles. There are 10 on our stage. We, are, we just returned from a fine walk in the woods. Roughing it, I am justice. Now, the publisher of this postcard is Haynes. Haynes also owned the, the Manita Yellowstone stagecoach line. And this is a, a hand tinted photograph of one of his stagecoaches with the upper geyser basin and uh, upper uh, the upper falls of the Yellowstone in the background. Uh, the people who rode on stagecoaches were referred to as the carriage trade, and they were often wealthy or people of means. Uh, Educated. Draw, horse-drawn transportation was the only form of transportation in the park until motorized transportation was authorized in August 1915. And then in 1917, uh, horse-drawn transportation was uh, no longer allowed in the park because there was there were too many wrecks between motorized transportation and, and stagecoaches and buggies. Uh, but I wanted to show this image because Haynes is the same person that published the postcards. And actually, uh, in 1916, when the National Park Service was established, they told Haynes that he had to limit his business ventures in the park because he was too ambitious and he was trying to take over too many of the different businesses in the park. And he got mad and retired, and then his son took the business over. This is August 8th, 1906. And the message says, Dear friend, a stage tipped over and was smashed to pieces at this place last Saturday, and five people were injured, but none of them very bad. This place is five miles this side of Mammoth Hot Springs. Hope to hear from you soon, EEC. This is a real photo postcard of an REO auto at the entrance to Yellowstone Park. It would date pre-August 15, 1915. Uh, there's a fence up that uh, keeps cars and buses from entering the park. Uh, and it, it, it would be similar to the, the other card we saw of the people who had the flat coming to the park uh, and not being allowed to enter the park at that time. This is a real photo postcard uh, circa 1917 of a white touring bus and you can see the logo on the door is a round logo with that bear we talked about in the center of the logo. And um, the tourists would take these go on these buses and have their picture taken upon their return they could purchase a real photo postcard of themselves in the bus and this bus went out of west yellowstone montana this is a later version of the bus a linen postcard dated july 30th 1937 and the message says we are staying here at old faithful lodge today and have seen old faithful go off a number of times. These are the kind of buses we travel in. White. Lots of bears around these parts. You will have to take a trip here sometime. Love, Mother. This is Chapter 10, Camping and Campgrounds. Um, okay. In 1917, the camping companies were consolidated into one larger company uh, that was actually run by the Yellowstone Park hotel company, uh, and this shows early cars coming in to, that, to the upper, Wiley Upper Basin Camp. This is another bright morn. This is our third day in the park, and we are enjoying ourselves very much. We are camping at the Old Faithful Campgrounds. 
We've seen the O Faithful play two times now and also dozens of other geysers. At night, they throw the searchlights on the O Faithful and just looks wonderful. We're going to do some fishing for trout today. The women are all wearing knickers out here, even women as old as 60 and 65 years old. We are all well. This is four <laughs> cards and a set of six that show different days on the Wiley Way Camping Company. Uh, this is a rare set. It was very hard to find. It took us a long time to put this set together. And we actually thought there were only five cards in the set. People entering and exiting the park at the Western entry. But we found out at, recently that there's a sixth card in the set for people exit the, the park and the Northern entry. Uh, we haven't seen card number six. Uh, this is a rare set of cards. Uh, and if you have these, uh, you might want to uh, sh show collectors that you have them. This is chapter 11 called Postals from Wonderland, which is a general category. Um, this message is from 1912 of women picking wildflowers in the park. And it says all the tables in the park hotels are supplied with the park wildflowers. Some of the flowers found in the park are violets and primrose. Then it goes on to list 32 other kinds of flowers that I won't name. <laughs> And there are a hundred more. And today, this um, this picking flowers is not allowed. It is illegal in the in the park. This is chapter twelve called Gateway Communities. And my aunt gave me her postcard collection before she passed away. And this is one of her messages from August seventeenth, nineteen fifty six. Uh, she was writing to my grandmother. Dear mother, the plane is an hour late. We were at this sign last night at 830. We went all the way through the park and out the Red Lodge Cook City Highway. Got to bed at one and up at four. Awful. Saw lots of bears, deer, moose. Got caught in the rain taking pictures. Right. Love, Margil. At the end of the day, after tourists were in the park, uh, many of them would come back to the gateway communities. Uh, this is a, a circa 1963 Chrome postcard of West Yellowstone, Montana. Uh, we were just there uh, two days ago. <laughs> it looks exactly like this, except that the cars are different now. Uh, and it's the evening. It's been a long day. Uh, and the tourists will rest up and prepare to go to the park again tomorrow. I have, I'd like to just go over a summary of, of what we've talked about. Uh, postcards are, are the quintessential souvenir. Uh, they serve as an effective and affordable means of communication. Uh, they are important historical documents. Postcards from the golden age made an impact on society much like the internet did almost 100 years later. Postcards have shaped and influenced the public's perception of Yellowstone Park more than any other souvenir. Postcards and postcard messages are manifestations of social history. Handwritten messages and documents need to be curated and saved in this age of digital virtual communication. Collectors should consider making their collections available for research. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the, the following people for helping us in many different ways. Larry and Thea Lancaster for their help in dating and verifying information. Andy and Judy DeBoer for their helping us understand the railroads that service the park. Tom Mulvaney for getting us involved in the postcard hobby. Uh, Tom is the reason that we uh, became postcard addicts. Hal Ottaway for, and I should say Al too, for all of their work with the Wichita Postcard Club over the years and for taking a chance and letting Tom Mulvaney and myself make the presentation on National Park Postcards in 1996. Mike Francis and Kathy Burke for their work on the Yellowstone Postcard Checklist, which was a huge undertaking. Uh, and they did a tremendous job. It took them about five years to put that together. 
Yellowstone and National Park postcard collectors and dealers who have supported the hobby. And last but not least, to the postcard publishers who produce the postcards we love so much. Jack and I wanted to give everyone a, a digital postcard, which is um, what you can get today. <laughs> Um, this was done for the 150th anniversary, and the photograph is by Tom Murphy. It's of the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone, and the postcard message says, 5 p.m. June 6, 2022, to our Yellowstone collecting friends. Happy 150th anniversary, Yellowstone. Enjoy the present, plan for the future. Susan and Jack Davis. And it is sent to Yellowstone fans and collectors, USA and worldwide. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, my gosh. Isn't this just amazing? And thank you both for such a wonderful presentation and for showing us so many uh, neat images and the backgrounds and telling about it. As a kid, I went there five different times with my family. I was so lucky. Mother just loved the place. And we would go and, you know, would go around in our little Ford car. It, uh, lots of wonderful memories and the smell of the, uh, the sulfur. geysers and <laughs> uh, yes, the sulfur. Exactly. But I can remember that and, uh, seeing morning glory pool and, You've seen that on many of the postcards too, but hey, Bill how, Burton, how, how, can I interrupt you just for a second? How this got, I hmm. forgot to mention um, that we were going to offer uh, anyone today uh, a copy of our book for free shipping. We would ship for no cost uh, and it's available for sale on our website uh, and we would refund the shipping costs. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm we sure that we'll, we'll have that uh, uh, link and everything, and then maybe we can get uh, uh, Phil McDaniels to uh, put that link in the uh, next newsletter, too, as a reminder, and would make a, a wonderful Christmas gift or birthday or anniversary <laughs> gift for a lot of us. Uh, I wanted to go to Bill Burton to see if there are any comments or questions that were posted during the presentation. Bill, can you? Yes, there are. Um, Hal Ottaway, um, for some reason, uh, not only summed it up, uh, uh, how much we enjoyed it, but was kind enough to write a message about it, um, which you can view if you click the chat button. Um, we have a, a, a comment uh, from Mark Moss that says, when you visit gateway communities uh, such as West Yellowstone today, how many and what sort of postcards at the souvenir stores uh, are less and less often found even in, at tourist spots these days? Are there a lot of uh, postcards uh, available at the various tourist spots? Uh, my impression is there's less than there used to be because we we always bought postcards and now there's just not the same selection as there used to be. I know that. Yeah. Well, to answer your question, I would say there's probably fewer postcards. Uh, yeah. About five years ago, there was a small building that was run by the Yellowstone Park Foundation where they had people take pictures of themselves with a background image and send it off as a virtual postcard uh, uh, with a smartphone. So I would say there's fewer postcards. Okay, Alan uh, Milbrand uh, points out, uh, just to reiterate, that the, the book uh, of, vint uh, of uh, mental <laughs> vintage images uh, that we're talking about here is Postals from Wonderland. Um, and that's that shouldn't that can't be reiterated too often uh, you guys did such a tremendous job on this um i can't believe anybody could produce a book like this in six months uh, <laughs> even if you have all the same material in front of you it's just amazing well it was a huge undertaking sue's mother spent a couple of years organizing the cards into general categories and that was a big help to us she did that a few quite a few years ago when she retired so they were already pre-organized into categories for us which really helped us uh, but it, it was a big job and uh, it, it was very time consuming 
Okay, Hugh Cox says, absolutely fabulous. Um, I don't think you can top that comment, but uh, you can try. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, Lynn Paulson simply, uh, jumps in and says, this was a great presentation and I plan to buy the book, Great Research and Collecting. Um, hint, hint, I think, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, oh, you, you know, we're, we're hoping that we shed some light on messages as part of the reason that people would collect postcards uh, for the messages on, on the cards. Okay. Uh, Larry, who didn't give his last name, says Jack and Sue have been uh, mentored to so many YNP, which I assume stands for Yellowstone National Park collectively. <laughs> and that's important uh, for us because people, if, if there's nobody there to help guide you, you're going to look at the, the relatively small number of cards that apparently are available in tourist shops and say, well, that's that, that's all we're going to see. But that's really not true. I was basically reading postcard messages for probably 30 years to compile enough messages. So mm. it, it was a labor of love. <laughs> Robert Bell says, very well done. Thank you. Uh, I'm on your website. Do you ship to Canada? No, but we'll meet him at the border. <laughs> ah, good deal. <laughs> yes, we would ship there. Yes. It's, Thank you very it's much. Quite a bit uh, more expensive. <laughs> Kate Clark uh, says, I thought it was so interesting that even in, the, in 1939, tourists were getting the wildlife. We're getting too close to the wildlife. That's <laughs> That wasn't the beginning of getting too close to the wildlife, was it? Didn't some of the bears wall people a lot earlier than that? Well, people have been stupid for a long time. <laughs> um, that doesn't answer the question. That sounds amazing. You no, know, way back when, when they called them the beggar bears, they were feeding them candy usually and oranges and things that they really liked. And the mess we have so many bear messages and most of them say how tame the bears are. They're very tame. They're tame. They're tame. And as long as they were feeding them candy, they were tame. But I think there were things that happened when they quit feeding them that didn't get put on the messages. Once in a while, there was a message that said they had to shoot a bear or somebody got their hand bit in the camp last night because of a bear and that kind of thing. So there were, you know, things going on like that. Yeah, there was a video of a man feeding bear uh, marshmallows to a bear and mm -hmm. he got about halfway done with his bag of marshmallows and he said okay that's it we're done and he put him in his coat and turned around and the bear ripped the coat off of him <laughs> Oops. served him right he says i'm not done with the marshmallows <laughs> he didn't get the memo <laughs> uh maury williams says uh, excellent outstanding um we're all waiting uh for hal Holloway's next postcard book Sign Morgan. Oh. Not sure what that means. Um, and Kyle Jolliffe, uh, one could probably do a presentation using Yellowstone cards from the Newbury Library Kurt Ty collection. True, Kyle? I, I would think so. So I saw some Kurt Ty cards in the, in the presentation. There were sure. some, are you talking about Kurt Ty, Kurt Ty cards? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, Kurt Ty comedy cards. Uh, yeah, we have, well. <laughs> we have thousands of Kurt Ty cards. <laughs> yeah, we have Kurt Ty cards. Uh, but you, if you go back to the golden age of postcards, that was a primary uh, means of communicating. And then if you get into the 30s, uh, people could make phone calls. Uh, there were other ways to communicate. So postcards kind of lost a little bit of favor at that time uh, compared to the golden age. No, I, I guess part of my point is that if you go to the Newberry Library, you can find the actual production files, you know, with the mock-up cards of the final version. And that would be interesting, you know, to, to track the, the chain of production through those files. Absolutely, it would be, yes. And what about the Detroit publishing postcards? Well, that, that's an interesting story. Um, there's, some, uh, there's a lot of mystery around Detroit publishing, and I've been trying to um, understand a lot of that myself. Um, 
it would almost make for another presentation. And there's a lot of things I don't know. There's some things I do know. Um, Tell them about the Detroit and chromos. Are you familiar with Detroit chromolithographic prints? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, they preceded the postcards. Chromolithographic uh, prints. Yeah. Well, the chromos, they were called chromos. They were thin prints uh, circa 1896 through about 1905. But what happened was that postcards became so popular that Detroit Publishing uh, discontinued doing chromolithographic prints and began to produce postcards. It was a business decision. And Haynes bought the um, bankruptcy. Stuff. And in 1932, Jack Haynes, the son of F.J. Haynes, purchased the Detroit Publishing bankruptcy inventory and had it shipped back to Montana because it contained a lot of Yellowstone Park uh, material that he was going to sell in his shops. Well, Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> no. It's, 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 more questions. It, it's a complicated, I mean, it's fairly complicated. I think we tell that story in our Smucker book because the Smucker artwork came out of that Detroit publishing bankruptcy uh, stock and that came to Bozeman also. Yeah, that uh, Detroit publishing story has never been told. There's there's many complete uh, mysteries, unknown information. Uh, Alan Lowe uh, published his book on Detroit publishing. Uh, so did uh, the lady. What was her name? You yeah, need, need to look at this book, An American Odyssey by Tashin. Yes, and that that it looks like a Detroit publishing image on the front. Yeah, there's also Yellowstone cards inside. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert Bell says, uh, how, "How do you order? Uh, how do you order from Canada? The website doesn't accept uh, Canadian addresses." That's because we uh, took it off. But if if they if they want to send us an email, uh, we can get back to them with ordering information. Right. Jack, what was the name of the Detroit uh, publisher that you mentioned, Alan? Alan Lowe, was that his name? Al Alan Lowe, L-O-W-E. Oh, oh, is that not, it's not Reverend Lowe, Dr. Lowe's book? Okay, it, Alan may be wrong, but I know his last name is L-O-W-E. Yeah, it's um, uh, James, oh, Reverend uh, James Lowe. Okay. He did the first Detroit book, him and um, yeah. Papel, Ben Papel. Yes, and then there was an, uh, Nancy Stick Schulte, is that her yes, name? Yes, Nancy, Nancy Stick. Nancy Stick Schulte did a, a, a checklist, a Detroit Publishing checklist. Um, but the informa Detroit Publishing information is, we were told that they burned business records uh, in the factory uh, to heat up the factory prior to the bankruptcy sale. And so there's a lot of information that was lost. Right, because they were uh, during the, just before the depression or during the depression. Yes, yes. They threw cards, boxes of cards into the furnace. Yes, the yes. One. Oh, how and horrible! Yeah, it was a sad situation. Uh, we did buy um, about ten boxes of mint Detroit publishing cards uh, at the Haynes auction in 1993 that came from the factory. Oh, wow. Interesting, interesting. They had little there. tissue papers between each card. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those things, they're so beautiful because they're uh, print, they're litho prints. They're miniature uh, printed on stone. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. yes. We, we, had, we had some of the early chromos with pieces of stone on the chromo. Oh, little, yeah. little pieces. Oh. And they were only good for about 500 strikes, and then they had to recarve them. So usually 500 was the number, or 400 was the number uh, of prints um, that they could make from the stone. Yes. Yeah. Before, the, before the sandstone, the limestone wore out. Yes. Well, after Alan uh, put on this tremendous uh, amount of lengths, which we all ought to thank him for, um, he writes, uh, he also gives us Jack's email address, which is uh wonderland montana at gmail.com i got that right now that one works yes okay yes um and then 
I think this is the last one. Shavlavin says, uh, enjoyed your talk very much. Thanks for a wonderful job. I think that oh, wraps you. it up, pal. Thank, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming. And thanks, Bill, for fielding the questions. Yes, we can all clap. And uh, we want to thank Jack and Susan for being here today, for Bill Burton for helping us with the questions. Thank you all so very, very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Happy Thanks. postcarding, everybody. Thank you, Hal. Thanks, Hal. You bet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.